Hi, I'm Kat Powers here in the SCAT building, and we are talking with Councilor at Large Jake Wilson. Hi, Kat. This is your first term. It is my first term. How's it going? It's going. It's going quickly. Uh, it seems like it was just a few months ago when we got inaugurated, and here we are over a year in, and now basically looking, looking at re-election right around the corner here in 2023. Are you running for re-election? I'm running for re-election to uh, the city council at large. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating race. We've seen Will M. Baugh, uh declare his candidacy, so already we have you know, five experienced city councilors running for four seats. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and I hear there could be some more names entering the fray here soon. So it looks like it could be a fascinating campaign season. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. So what, as counselor, have you, what have you learned so far? Wow, what haven't I learned? Uh, it, it's funny. Um, <laughs> so I'm someone who's fairly involved in the city before I ran uh, for office. And I, I really felt like I knew a lot about my city and knew what was going on. And then you run for office and you do all these candidate forums and fill out candidate surveys and questionnaires and you learn about all this other stuff uh, that you never knew about before. And then if you're lucky enough to get elected and you take your job seriously and want to know what you're voting on and understand how the city works, um, you end up then just amassing all of this knowledge of how the city works. And now I look back and it's sort of like, I can't believe anyone ever gets elected to these positions, you know, as a non-incumbent, knowing as relatively little about, you know, the realities of the city um, as they do. Like, it's, it's wild to me to compare, like, my knowledge of just how Somerville government works now with what it was uh, pre the 2021 campaign. What are the things that you wish you knew running as a first-time candidate? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you talking campaign-wise? Sure. Or, uh, I mean, I took a really good candidate training uh, through Mass Alliance. I wish I could say I followed all of the things that we were taught. Uh, there were some things that for financial or time or, you know, just, I don't know, for whatever reason I did not do. And I very clearly grew to understand why those were best practices. Mm. Um, I guess I, I ran a very weird campaign in 2021. First of all, it was very late breaking. I was tied up with a transition with Somerville Youth Soccer, basically up through the preliminary election. I'm frankly thankful that we had a pre that we didn't have a preliminary because I might have been in real trouble. Uh, so to explain, yeah, uh, there were eight candidates running. There were. So because there are four seats. Yep and two people for each position, yes. that did not force a preliminary race. Correct, although 10 people, I believe, pulled papers. Mm -hmm. Only eight of us turned them in, though. So I was thinking initially I was gonna be uh, a preliminary campaign. Um, in the end, though, uh, yeah, it, basically, I, the, it's always tough. To, any sort of transition in leadership of a nonprofit is always gonna be tricky, and, and you know, the knowledge transfer and every, you know. And you had been with youth soccer. I, yeah, I, re I had been the president of Somerville Youth Soccer for the previous three years, and they had hired an, an executive director, and it w I was determined to make sure that the handoff was smooth. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it, selfishly, I, you know, it, I could have, it probably would have been easier campaign-wise to just walk away and say, well, you know, I said, I said I was, you know, my term ended on this date. Um, but when you work so, so long and so hard on something, you can't just kind of wash your hands of it and walk away. So... Uh, yeah, I would, did a lot. Basically, I spent my summer, rather than campaigning, I spent my summer working on, it, it's one of those things where I, basically the, the fall season is the big planning season for youth soccer. Mm -hmm. And so I generally did that planning work while showing the executive director how to do it. And generally, I've found when you're showing someone how to do something, it generally takes about three times as long as if you just did it yourself, uh, especially the third time around. So yeah, uh, I found myself, you know, I remember emailing the, the soccer board um, the night of the preliminary election, just saying, season's underway. Uh, it's, you know, I can't help you anymore. Like it's, I need to focus on my campaign. And then I did. And I, it, there's a perception out there that I didn't knock doors in 2021. I knocked doors. All my doors that I knocked were generally in the last seven weeks of the campaign. And, uh, I knocked a lot of doors those final seven weeks. And I, I did it generally all myself. I had probably five people who knocked doors for me, probably an average of you know, 20 or 30 per person. Other than that, I knocked the other 
thousands of doors myself. <laughs> so you uh, you ran on a number of issues. Yeah. The uh, you had a base where you knew a lot of uh, soccer families, soccer parents. Yeah. Do you, in the process of becoming a candidate and then as a counselor, what did you learn about the city? Huh. Well, I mean, I, I learned that there, despite what uh, what it might feel like, there still are a lot of families in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I ran on more than just family issues in the city, but I mean, that that's a big part of what motivates me. I feel like, you know, nationally, we don't do a very good job of supporting families. You know, it's a wonder. <laughs> people, people ask, like, why is our national birth rate so low? And I always reply, like, have you seen how little we do for families? We don't encourage it, people to have to have kids. We don't make it easy to be a family. So one of the things I like to do is, is, is try to find ways that Somerville can support families and make this a city where families want to stay. I didn't arrange for somebody to walk by with a stroller, by the way. That, was the, that actually worked out pretty well. That worked out well. <laughs> so the, um, your first year as a candidate, yeah. uh, sorry, as a counselor, my apologize. Your first year as a, can as a counselor, what were the big issues you faced? Oh, I, the biggest issues were probably just we had a new council for the for you know no not for the most part technically five of us were new mm -hmm. um, you know a six that was their first full term mm -hmm. um, we had a new administration and I feel like 2022 there was a lot of kind of getting our feet under ourselves and you know a lot of especially you know with some big issues there were you know there were studies and consultants and listening sessions and you know taking it all in and kind of processing uh, the the big things were probably i mean i can think there were there were contentious things like a vote on a traffic enforcement grant fifty thousand dollar grant where um, there was a quota on the number of traffic stops that a number of us objected to and we ended up for the first time in over a decade not accepting that grant because of that mm -hmm. i'm told now that the language has been stripped out of the grant application where there's no longer a quota so it'll probably be a different conversation this time around um, in terms of like the the big you know obviously the the budget we had a 309 million dollar proposed budget that ended up 312 313 million after supplemental appropriations it's a huge number, you know, it's up from, you know, <laughs> about half that amount, you know, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, you know, it's part of the new growth that we've seen in the city. Like we can, we suddenly, we're, we're not the Somerville that we used to be for so long where we tried to do less with more. Uh, we're actually getting some money now where we can attack some things. And that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, big things we did, Clarendon Hill, advancing that, getting that off and running, you know, that's an important project on the west side of the city. Uh, Clarendon Hill being a Somerville Housing Authority property that yes. is being rebuilt and has some market rate housing in it? Yeah, it's going to be basically, and we're not losing, I believe, we're, as I understand, we're not losing any of the, any of the units. Mm -hmm. uh, the affordable the, the, units. The, the public housing uh, units there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there will be some, I, my understanding is, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It needed to be done. The, the state of, of those units was unacceptable mm -hmm. uh, between mold and just, you know, general, you know, the, a lot of them were uninhabitable. You know, it was built, uh, my understanding, it was built as, as post-war housing. Um, when GIs had come back, you know, it, was, it, it, it had not aged well and it was time to, it, it needed to be replaced. 1945 post-war housing. Yes. So before, before most of the city council, well, the, none of the city councilors were born it, the, all this housing is older than the entire council, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Considerably older than the mm -hmm. entire council. Yeah. All right. Yep. So you've done, uh, you've done uh, what I understand is the North Street property you're calling Clarendon Hill. Um, the, uh, what, what were the other big issues the council faced? And to be clear on that one, we were just coming in late. The big decisions had already been made there. That was basically just some, some final things that needed to be done and, you know, around the the water and sewer around utilities and, and basically the final accounting around that to kind of make the numbers fully uh, official and, and, and really make it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the tough votes, the big things had already been decided. I, I don't want to make it sound like we came in and, you know, we, we sort of just got it over the line, mm -hmm. um, I would say. So that, you know, yeah, that's, that's not, you know, the last update I, I saw, I think a third of the buildings have already been, the work has been started on them. Um, but yeah, in terms of other things, the, the current big thing is 299 Broadway, which just now is coming to the council. 
Uh, it's the former Star Market site in Winter Hill, right around the corner from my house. I've been involved in that first as a resident before getting elected. Uh, and then once I got elected, I was a member of the Winter Hill uh, Community uh, Advisory Council, or sorry, Civic Advisory, Civic Advisory Committee. It's the CAC, uh, Winter Hill Civic Advisory Committee. Uh, that basically worked with that, you know, I won't go into, it's a long story, but basically we're given a, we, there's a plan to take it by eminent domain potentially through an urban, urban renewal plan, but we're given a, develop, a private developer a crack at it first. And they just got uh, approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals. They're doing a Chapter 40B, which is a state mechanism around affordable housing that basically consolidates everything for basically one vote before the Zoning Board of Appeals as opposed to doing all this license uh, permitting stuff through you know, various departments. It just it streamlines it, speeds it up, and, and makes it a simpler process. And they just got that approval last week. And so now the city council is gonna be asked to take up, uh, it's called a UCTIF, it's a tax increment financing that basically gives a tax break uh, over, it's a, it's a tax break that recedes over time, but basically it's, uh, it's a sort of, I view it as subsidizing affordable housing. It's a huge, this, this project that is looking at, it, it happened in there at 290 Broadway, it's 288 units of housing, 132 units of affordable housing, and like two and three, a lot of two and three bedroom units for families, and like at, at like 30 percent, 60 percent of area median income. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I view these are huge numbers. They could, they'll keep people. I bet they keep people I know in the city, who otherwise might have to move out to the suburbs. You know, if their if their rent goes up or if their apartment gets condoized or sold. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to have this discussion about what, you know, what, basically how we can get some other really good stuff potentially added to this project if we're going to be subsidizing it with tax dollars. In this case, by not taking tax dollars, as, as many tax dollars. We're, we have more money. Yeah. Is that because of federal ARPA funding? This is basically COVID relief funds coming into the city. Or is this because we have much, much more development? I'm asking, you're the finance guy here well, it, on the it's council, It's both right? in terms of the operating budget. So the ARPA is separate from the operating budget. ARPA is for basically one-time things. You can't use ARPA funds to like create a new department and you know, fun, you know, create positions that you're gonna need to fund year after year. ARPA is a one, hopefully, let's hope ARPA is a one-time only thing. As nice as, as it is to have 77.7 or whatever million dollars mm -hmm. Uh, come in. Let's hope this is the only time we have to do anything like this, right? Uh, though I'd love to see more infrastructure spending at the federal level and, and state level in our city. But uh, yeah, the, the, the growth uh, that we've seen in the city, the new growth, especially on the commercial side, I mean, there's, it's big money. The permit fees that we get are just huge. Mm -hmm. the, the permit fees alone for 101 South Street, the new biotech building that's now up and running over at Boynton Yards, were, they were a godsend for the city. When the pandemic hit, uh, those, those helped, really helped keep the lights on, prevent you know, layoffs and furloughs. Um, yeah, and, and those, that new growth. So it comes in as permit fees, right? When it's being, when they wanna build it, you get the, the, per, the building permit fees from that. And then once it's built, you, then it comes in as new growth. Uh, and then you're taxing that in our commercial tax rate is significantly higher than our residential tax rate. Does that mean that eventually homeowners are going to see relief or that's money that is going to be used for upgrade of projects like rebuilding City Hall or other projects? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. We were, <laughs> when we saw the tax rate uh, this past year, uh, we did take note at the city council level that the tax rate went up a small, very small amount. Mm -hmm. um, and we did ask the assessor about that because it's true. One of the things that the previous administration did go around touting to people was that new commercial growth would allow us to lower our residential tax burden. And, you know, I guess it, it comes down to uh, because of Prop 2.5, it limits our overall growth of the overall tax levy to, to a max of 2.5% per year. Um, it's an, it raises an interesting question basically about like, well, do we lower residential taxes and 
have a smaller budget than we could otherwise have, or given that we were basically in municipal austerity mode for decades and decades and decades, do we keep those level and then take the extra money that comes in from commercial and, and basically try to go back and you know, make up for lost time in terms of infrastructure? Because we, <laughs> we have three separate major infrastructure issues as a result of, of fail, you know, failure to spend on, on our infrastructure in the past. Uh, all of them are 10 digit problems. You know, we have our, our, sewer, our sewer, water and sewer system, we have our street surfaces, and we have our vertical infrastructure, our, built, our municipal buildings. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna take, we, <laughs> we've kicked the can down the road for a long time and the, we can't do it anymore. Our buildings are crumbling. Um, you know, our fire stations, for example, are, are, many of them are in terrible condition. Um, the, the pandemic exposed our schools you know, for what they are in terms of, you know, we have two school buildings that are obsolete and need to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to build, you know, at least one replacement school at this point. So it's, uh, all that is to say, like, we're probably not going to be able to give a big tax cut uh, on the property tax side, but it, the, the commercial tax base, I would imagine, and this is, this is not something that we have jurisdiction over. This is the, the administration and the finance department and the assessor's office and whatnot. Um, but my hope is that it keeps it pretty steady, which if you look at Middlesex County, our taxes here in Somerville, our property taxes um, rate wise are at the lower end. We're not Cambridge where their property taxes are, you know, ridiculously, theirs are like half of what ours are, but they have such a huge commercial tax base. They've been able to keep their residential property tax rate low. One of the things you can do is the, uh, our mayor is putting in front of the council, uh, making you put together a list of your priorities. Yeah. And then that is something that, it, how exactly does that work? You put together priorities and then she shepherds them through the budget process or you're tracking them? How does that work? Well, it's, uh, so it started last year. It was a really welcome thing that the mayor formally reached out to the council with a communication requesting um, individual counselors budget priorities for the FY23 budget. And, you know, there was some discussion, well, you know, what, what is she looking for? Are they, you know, are they, it, it, the answer that came back was, well, she wants to hear what in, individual counselors want. And I thought, well, I think we can go one better. I think we could actually take those. Uh, and we had 179 individual budget party resolutions come in from my, my colleagues and, and me. And we then took those up at a special finance committee meeting of the whole uh, on March 30th, I want to say. And... We based, using a very innovative survey approach, the, we had to go to the attorney general's office to get sign off on this approach, but we did this pretty innovative thing where we identified everyone, you know, the top budget priorities for everyone. We tried to sort of bucket them together, group them together, and then had, colleagues were asked to vote like for their top, I think we said top 10. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at who got, which ones got the most votes and starting with the things that got the most votes, we worked down and tried to sort of explore the edges of, of where we had agreement on them and then craft resolutions uh, from the entire council, unanimously approved, that, uh, that called on uh, the administration to, to increase funding for these areas. And we ended up with 10 of them. And so some of them were, uh, some of them, yeah, some of them did get addressed, you know, some of them didn't. Um, you know, even if it weren't for, you know, seeing those things, some of them show up in the budget, it was also very useful just as a tracking document. Like, for example, we just got an update on that, you know, now that the 2023 budget, the FY 2023 budget is generally sort of all baked in. Um, we got an update last month from the administration basically going through and, show, and, and saying what they did or didn't do on each of the 10 that we passed. So it's a good, I'd say it's a good reference point and a good way to track what we came up with and how it actually did or didn't get integrated into the budget. A focus that you want to take on this year is oh, yeah. communication. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, so we, there is a communication department mm -hmm. at City Hall, yep. um, which uh, also runs their cable channels and uh, city communications. How, or is this changing what they do? Oh, and first, I want to be clear, like, I think our communications department, I think they do great work. I think our, our you know, for relative to, to what the landscape looks like of municipal communications, I think we have, we have good municipal communications. But I mean, that's my background is, is communications and journalism. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, I've, I've seen this and, you know, I've, I've worked with this. It was one of the things I, one of the first things I changed when I went into to Somerville Youth Soccer into a leadership position was dramatically change how communication was done there. Um, I think it's one of those things where, uh, you know, even people who do communication well can still do much better. You know, we can always do better at it. So yeah, I, I, you know, I just coming in with ideas, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, we just got a new website. We're still kind of figuring out how to use that. Um, you know, I, I want to see that maximized. Um, you know, I want to see, I, I'm just big on how information is presented to people. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, but you talk about like communications, public information and community engagement, civic engagement, right? These are, these are three things that I think as a city, I'd love to see us really up our game at. So how do you engage the public in the government business? Yeah, that's, I mean, there are people who I consider to be extremely involved in the city who spend all sorts of their personal time following meetings, like trying to be involved. And it, it's, def, it's very discouraging for me to find out how tough it is in many cases for them to, to find out basic information about what's happening. Um, you know, as a result, like people, like there are people who I consider to be extremely engaged who don't know about things that I would just, that I think are just vital things to know about. I mean, part of that, let, let's talk about it. Part of that is just the death of, of media, the death of local media. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's dire here. It's, you know, I just, every week I shake my head at what the Somerville Journal has, has been, sorry, Medford Transcript and Somerville Journal now. Uh, has become basically a collection of USA Today articles. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a travesty. Um, you know, we have the Somerville Times that's, that's out there covering some stuff. We had the, the Somerville Wire. They couldn't, they had to base, I don't know if you saw this, they had to run a, uh, basically a fundraiser to, just to try to get, you know, a quarter of the year paid for to hire, to hire a professional writer. And, you know, journalism locally is just, I mean, it, it, it's important everywhere, but like locally, like that's that's the transparency, that's the that's the, the that's the sunlight, right? That prevents corruption, that prevents, you know, that that, that calls out, uh, you know, a government that's not functioning well. So that's interesting. So if you have government communications, mm -hmm. you're looking for that government to be transparent about itself, because. Ordinarily, you know, I mean, when I was a journalist here in Somerville, mm -hmm. it was me calling Mike Capuano or Dot Gay or uh, or Joe Curtitone and just and, and you know, it's like you should be doing X, Y, or Z and calling them out. Um, how does the how do you ensure a government communication is transparent? How does that happen? It's a good question because sometimes, you know, communications departments can become almost like, you know, do, they can almost become engaged in PR work mm -hmm. for the city. Uh, is, that, I, I'm not saying, is that their job? That's a great question. It's a okay. great existential question about a communications department, <laughs> okay. right? Uh, I, you know, just my personal philosophy and I, what I want, I would like to see us err on the side of transparency, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's covering a, you know, a, a shooting that happened in the city and getting out information on that, you know, I understand like, you know, there's a reluctance to highlight, you know, troubling news, things that might upset people. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when we don't talk about it, uh, it just gives the impression that it's being swept under the rug. So, uh, I don't have a great answer to your question just because like it just gets to me it's it just gets to the heart of like what it like what are we doing here you know like similar to like a public pro like public processes like what <laughs> I have existential questions about how like a, how a public process functions in Somerville you know like we we we, we say we embrace that and I just wonder like ultimately like what is it what is it for what does it accomplish how does it work who's involved you know is a public process a way for you know, city staff or electeds to sort of see which way the wind's blowing and either push ahead with something they want to do or pump the brakes on it if they sense that it's going to not be received well. Mm -hmm. uh, or is it actually an opportunity for the community to have real input on things? You know, I've seen, I've seen it work both ways. I've attended neighborhood meetings where the neighborhood showed up with phenomenal suggestions for a developer. Absolutely phenomenal. Like, that made the project better. Right. Um, and then I've seen processes where it was clear that you know, views that views from the public that that weren't uh, particularly welcome, 
were, you know, there, there were efforts to basically shunt the off and, uh, you know, try to, try to minimize that, basically, to try to kind of erase voices. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just, what, if we have a meeting about, like, how is, how is that quantified? How is it collected? How is it synthesized and, and integrated into, into the project? You know, I just, and, and maybe I'm asking for the impossible. Maybe you can't quantify that sort of thing. Maybe it, maybe it really is just, you know, a dog and pony show that we do to, like, gauge how people are feeling on it. But I think it's worth asking those questions. So if we as a public have a project or a thing that we want, if we, um, I don't know, we're looking at Union Square here, if we want more picnic tables yeah. out in Union Square, right, yeah. how do we go through the process of advocating for that with our government? Do we, I mean, is it is it just, does the council get a report on 311 calls? Do we send a note to the mayor at her home? Do we email counselors? How, how do you, how do we go about, we don't have a newspaper doing this, right? Yeah. So how should we be doing it? Well, uh, you could write the mayor. You can definitely write a ward counselor, an at-large counselor. And we're, you know, I'm generally happy to take things that constituents bring to me and, and request funding or, you know, even I, last year I, I did make some budget priorities based on things that were presented to me. Um, I'm happy to report that starting this year, we have a new uh, participatory budgeting initiative, PB, as we call it. We just got a, a presentation on that in the council PB chambers. PB, particip participatory budgeting. Basically, it's a- I wouldn't be able to say that four times fast. Yeah. Partici participatory <laughs> budgeting. I've said it a lot. Okay. Uh, but yeah, basically the way it works is it's a community-driven initiative that I, you know, identifies potential projects. There's a, a million dollars each year now mm -hmm. that it can be spent on these things. Uh, and basically there's a working group that puts together, you know, collects, you know, uh, proposals from people and, and works on, you know, getting them to a stage where they can go. Uh, I believe there is some gatekeeping by staff and by the mayor. I think anything has to be approved by the mayor. In, in the council chambers, I brought up like my concern about, I mean, we've seen like some of these things. We, we've laughed when boats get voted on by the public and named Bodie McBoatface, uh -huh. you know. It's a fun, I mean, if I were, in college, I would probably be out there doing the same thing, right? You know, it's definitely not criticizing that. But my question was you know, to the, the folks when they came before us was like, how do we stop, you know, the example I used was a uh, mocking SpongeBob. I don't know if you know the meme, but uh, a mocking SpongeBob statue being put in front of City Hall, you know, and I was assured that there are some guardrails on this. How do you pay for it? The participatory budgeting? Communications changes. Oh, communications changes. Uh, well, we're lucky that we have an ever-increasing budget. You know, we have to prioritize that and spend some of these new funds coming in on that. You know, yeah, the things that I would like to see done, they're going to cost money. You know, like a, a way, like a new, I'd love to see a new sort of comprehensive approach that lets constituents specify exactly how they want to be communicated with. I think you should be able to say, I want to get uh, emails and or text updates or robocalls or you know, <laughs> and, and be very specific about that. And you should be able to say what you want to hear them about, you know, things on your street, if you're interested in affordable housing, anything about affordable housing. I think we should really create a powerful tool to let constituents tell the city what they want to get. And then we need to have targeted communication because every time you send out a blast to an audience and it doesn't pertain to the person reading it, they're that much less likely to read the next text or email that you send them. And so by using these, like, I, it's something I did with, with Summer League Soccer, we used very targeted communication with a goal that every communication that someone got was something that they would want, that, that, that pertained to them, that was relevant to them. Because, like, that's good communication is, is a good hit to miss ratio on that. That's a fantastic way to end. So I have to say that I'm Kat Powers. I've been here talking with Jake Wilson. Thank you so much for coming by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Kat. All right.